The movies of Dwayne Esper are uniquely outrageous, even in the field of early exploitation cinema. The sheer sleaziness of overall atmosphere, disregard for narrative filmmaking conventions and sideshow-like depictions of the strange and unnatural in his movies must truly be seen to be believed. Little has been written about him, and not much is known about the man's life. Who was Dwayne Esper, the so-called king of the celluloid gypsies? Esper came into filmmaking purely by accident. As a young man, he worked as a barker in a carnival sideshow. He later went into real estate and acquired a film studio after a business deal went south. He made numerous silent westerns with actors like Tom Mix before finding his true calling as an auteur of voyeuristic perversity. On the gold ship. When Hollywood's motion picture production code was at its most prudish, heavily restricting what could be shown on screen, Esper and his contemporaries sidestepped the censors by claiming that their films had educational value. Esper's directorial debut was The Seventh Commandment, a risque story of an adulterous wife, which is now a lost film. After fellow exploiteer Lewis Sonny saw it in 1932, the two men became partners. Sonny would finance most of Esper's subsequent features. His next film was Narcotic, a moralistic anti-drug fable. The movie begins with one of the hallmarks of exploitation films, the square-up disclaimer, which states that the film we're about to see was not made to titillate, but to educate. All exploitation movies begin with a square-up, regardless of what sinister vice they claim to be addressing. The story of Narcotic concerns a middle-aged doctor who starts smoking opium at the recommendation of his Chinese friend. You were referring to opium. Yes, we Orientals do indulge. But due to character and antecedents, it is a harmless diversion to us. The screenplay was written by Esper's wife, Hildegard Stady, and based upon the life of her great-uncle, William Davies. Davies was an opium addict and medicine show huckster in the 1890s. Hildegard toured the Southwest with him as a young girl, appearing on stage as a nude, preteen snake dancer. In Hildegard, Dwayne seemed to find the perfect woman. They were kindred spirits, and they were creative partners. He directed and exhibited their films while she wrote the scripts, handled the censor boards, and kept the blue noses at bay. Narcotic is unique among Esper's films in that it has a solid script and a plot you can actually follow. Are we not successful? We have everything we need. In this little diversion, I find nothing else but rest. However, this was not what drew crowds to exploitation films back then. What really sold the tickets were scenes like this, depicting wild drug parties and other depraved shenanigans. <laughs> For audiences, the only advantage that exploitation films had over their Hollywood counterparts was the ability to show things expressly forbidden by the code. With this in mind, Esper fashioned his next film, Maniac, almost as a checklist of social taboos. <laughs> I get the skin. Rats eat a cat, but that is news. To appease the censors, the film was very thinly disguised as a treatise on mental illness. Despite his efforts, Maniac turned out to be a flop. Sex, drugs, and the corruption of youth were more bankable subjects than mental illness and science gone awry. His later films would mostly be contained to those reliable subgenres. Sex Madness deals with a woman who contracts syphilis and then gives it to her husband. Such a film would have been shown to gender-segregated audiences and preceded by a lecture from someone claiming to be a famous hygiene specialist. Cannabis, which was still legal but highly controversial in the early 30s, also turned out to be a goldmine for exploitation directors. As long as the film ended with the characters getting their violent comeuppance, they could indulge in as much decadent, reefer-fueled mania as they liked. Such is the case with Marijuana, the Weed with Roots in Hell. The most famous film that Esper would ever have his name attached to would be a little church group produced feature called Tell Your Children. After buying the rights from the original filmmakers, Esper retitled it Reefer Madness and roadshowed it as an exploitation film. Thanks to its rediscovery by college campus potheads, the film remains a beloved pop cultural staple. 
Independently financed filmmaking was a costly venture, and in order to maximize profitability, Esper also traveled across the country, exhibiting his films and others he'd acquired. His years as a carnival huckster served him well, as he used numerous Barnum-esque tactics to get people into theaters. His screenings were usually preceded by a burlesque show featuring whoever's wives he could round up on short notice. To drum up Ballyhoo for the safari film Forbidden Adventure, performers in ape suits appeared in theaters. His last film as a director was a sleazy documentary called Hitler's Strange Love Life. He took a 37 Mercedes on the road with him and claimed it was Der Fuhrer's car. Esper's contemporaries described him as one of the greatest con men they'd ever encountered. Dan Sonny, who succeeded his father as the head of Sonny Productions, called him the crookedest son of a bitch who ever walked the earth. He would routinely swindle his friends and enemies alike, then invite them over for dinner and charm them into not suing him. In the early 40s, he roadshowed MGM's freaks, seemingly without the studio's permission or knowledge. He would splice risque footage into unrelated films if an audience got impatient, and then take it back out again the next night if the cops showed up. His movies played in Catholic-dominated New England and mob-ruled Chicago, where no other exploitation films had ever been shown. He ran afoul of the law on numerous occasions, narrowly escaping obscenity charges either through oily charm or from sheer luck. In 1948, Esper sold his entire enterprise to the Sonny family. Clearly, for an America that had just been through World War II, movies about adulterers and cannabis smokers were no longer as shocking as they once had been. And so Duane retired, although he and Hildegard lived happily into their 90s as Los Angeles socialites. His films may not have been masterpieces, but they are fascinating relics that show us the taboos of a bygone era. Seventy years later, many of them were more shocking than anything we've seen today. Duane Esper might have been a product of his time, but in many ways, he was also ahead of it.